Thank you so much. Okay, so um, <coughs> I'd like to go on with my lecture, but before I do it, I'd like to just remind you what we talked about. So, first off, we covered four out of five things that you must know in order to be able to leave by a sphere. <laughs> so, if you do not know them, I end of the school, uh, you remain trapped here at least until next year's. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, you know, the second thing that we talked about is the kind of basics of atom photon interaction, and we sort of identify the key parameter which uh, governs basically the interaction between single atom and single photon. What is this key parameter? Cooperativity. It's cooperativity, or it's basically the probability of interaction between one photon and one atom. Okay? So, and basically, uh, this is where I stopped uh, yesterday. So, this key parameter, for example, uh, quantifies uh, the linearity of the medium. So specifically, in this kind of simple, in this simple uh, kind of situation where you just focus the line beam in the cloud of atoms, the probability of single atom single point interaction is a ratio of resonant absorption cross section to polarization, <coughs> and basically, you know, this gives you a number of atoms which will be required to, you know, generate for example, propagation of this beam. And then to saturate this, you will need as many photons as this number of atoms. And this gives rise to the kind of you know, figure of merit, how many photons do you need to produce a substantial nonlinear response. And of course, once you put a cavity, you multiply it by cavity finesse, and that's exactly what this cooperative is about. So basically, just kind of for you to have a physical <coughs> picture, uh, in the case when cooperativity is, is big, is large, you can really think about atom-photon interaction as a kind of you know, one-dimensional problem. So in other words, if you excite the atom, if cooperativity is large, you know in which mode the atom will emit. It will emit in a mode, which is a cavity mode, which then sort of escapes and propagates, for example, along this one-dimensional, uh, along certain direction. And this is, direction is one-dimensional vapor. But in the case where you know, when you know in which mode the atom emits, you of course can try to time reverse this process. Or in other words, if you put another atom downstream here, then you know that this photon will hit this atom with very high probability. <coughs> and so this kind of uh, gives rise to a lot of interesting possibilities. Basically, once you can do this kind of stuff, you can kind of rule the world of quantum uh, networks and quantum information. So uh, think about trying to entangle these two atoms. You can uh, absorb these incident photons. Uh, and this kind of absorption is governed by essentially time reversal of the emission. So if you emit this photon, if you can somehow time reverse this emission, this photon must come back to this atom, right? And uh, so then, for example, you can you know, move quantum information around. You can basically sort of pass the quantum information coded on this photon from this one atom and catch it with another. And the most significant color present talk, uh, this also gives rise to the conditions for single photon nonlinearity. Yeah, because basically when this photon comes, you will interact with this atom with very high probability, with nearly 100% probability, and because it's just one atom, one photon will be able to saturate it. So when the second photon comes, it will feel a different atomic response. So the key is the figure of merit uh, cooperativity. Okay, so how to implement it experimentally? So broadly speaking, there are three approaches. Right? So remember this uh, cooperativity. Uh, <coughs> one way of writing this down, right? This is basically uh, lambda squared absorption cross section transverse localization of, of your of the mode multiplied by cavity finesse. The number of bounces the photon makes. So, so there are basically three approaches that you can use, or the combination. One is uh, to make a very high quality cavity that is increases in mass, make the photon bounce around many, many times. That's one approach. So the second approach is to try to play with denominator here, to try to reduce d. So ordinarily, uh, you cannot really squeeze light beyond lambda, but you can try to come close. But actually, in, in some waveguides, uh, in certain types of waveguides, you can actually squeeze light beyond 
beyond, uh, beyond lambda, and then you can really make this thing already very, very close to unity, or even sort of exceed unity in some cases. And the final thing is the thing which I will begin. So this actually, you know, if I really make it to this topic, this is a bonus, promised bonus a topic, you know, so maybe an entertainment for tonight. This will not be as much fun as Roy's lecture, but perhaps it will be. Uh, so, but, you know, so what I would like to focus, what is, you know, uh, the topic of the school is really this first approach. And this first approach will try to play with denominator. So what I told you is that if a single, single atom, lambda squared is as is high cross-section as we can get, but actually it turns out that if we start playing with atoms, and particularly with strongly interacting atoms, we can effectively in here enhance this cross-section. And so this is a topic that I'd like to turn my attention to, um, and what I'll try to do, is just to begin with, give you some simple physical picture of how this will work, you know, and then kind of try to go step by step through the various pieces of physics which go into that. So basically, the idea is to try to enhance nonlinearity by strongly interacting atoms, and this was already discussed and it was mentioned in several talks, so basically what the approach which we'll take will make use of strong atom-photon interactions while AIT will go like an atomic ensemble, and then um, combine it with strong atom-atom interactions while the ring works. So the result of that will be a very strong photon-photon interaction. And uh, this, as I already mentioned, has been sort of a holy grail in the field, so there was a lot of kind of <coughs> theoretical work over uh, the years, uh, and these kind of interactions up to now have been only implemented in the kind of domain of KT QED uh, with atoms, you know, high finance cavities. But this is a different approach. Here we are taking a different route. So uh, to facilitate it, we'll make use of uh, Rydberg atoms, and uh, unfortunate that there was a lot, so many kind of good talks explaining physics of Rydberg atoms, so basically I can skip the introductions here. So the key thing which we will make use is the, com is the fact that Rydberg atoms have a combination of very long lifetimes, narrow lines, and strong interactions. So with the interactions between the Rydberg atoms, uh, basically being enhanced by some like 14 orders of magnitude compared to the ground state atoms or even more sometimes. So, and the idea that we will pursue is essentially the following. So, suppose that we start with two Rydberg atoms and suppose that they are very far away. So then we, of course, can drive these transitions into a Rydberg atoms. This could be single photon transitions in principle, but we will actually focus on two photon transitions. I will describe how this is done in, uh, shortly. So, and if the atoms are far away, then, you know, one could do, for example, radio oscillations and, you know, do all sorts of coherent, um, uh, operations. But if you take these two atoms and start bringing them uh, close to each other, then if both of the atoms are excited in the Rydberg state, you know, then there will be very strong interaction between them. And what this implies uh, for the kind of atom field interaction dynamics is that if we initially start with two atoms in the, in the ground state, and we try to excite them, then if these atoms come very close to each other. And uh, at some point, these atom-atom interactions will prevent, <coughs> uh, will block the excitation of the doubly excited state. So, in fact, the simultaneous excitation will be blocked at distances smaller than this so-called blocking radius, which actually can be quite substantial, can be um, on the order of uh, uh, 10 micrometers. So that's, of course, the essence of the effect of Rydberg blockade that many people talked about. So basically, if we start with the cloud of atoms, which uh, contains many atoms, but this cloud is smaller than this blockade radius, so in this kind of cloud, you will be able to excite one atom, but no more than one. Right? So the, uh, the states with uh, more than one excitation will be blocked. And so basically, you can think about this kind of blockaded uh, cloud as a kind of microatom where uh, uh, you can uh, sort of make transitions only between two states. One state is where all of the atoms in the ground state, and another state where basically you know, one atom excited. So 
kind of form, as if, as if everything is coherent, you will actually create this kind of collective states. You actually will excite one atom, you will not know which one, but so that's this kind of collective um, type excitations, which also already has been mentioned. Right? But so basically, for purposes of, of today's talk is that, you know, that there are really these two, that there are these only two states which are available. Now, this is, of course, the essence of dipole locate, and there are many experiments now which exploit this, and actually, uh, I'm sorry if I have not mentioned your group here, because it's kind of like a lot of space and stuff, but, but it is actually an exciting field, as, of course, you have learned through uh, this week. So what I would like to do is I would like to uh, exploit this effect for, uh, to enhance nonlinear optics and to move nonlinear optics in the quantum region. And the key here, that the key feature which I would like to exploit is the fact that uh, there are many, there can be many atoms in this cloud. So what does that mean? It means that, for example, if uh, there is one photon which comes in and tries to interact with this cloud, so there are like you know n uh, absorbers. These are like n hungry graduate students, which wait for free pizza to be delivered. <laughs> and you know, once this you know, small one tiny quantum bit of uh, pizza arrives, right, they all are trying to you know, eat it up very, very fast. So, and that's actually quite good. Right? So and the reason is that basically uh, what this means is that the uh, uh, probability of interaction of the single photon with this cloud of atoms here the blockaded cloud of atoms will be enhanced by the number of atoms in this cloud. So as a matter of fact, this probability of interaction will be equal to this kind of quantity, which is nothing but the optical depth of this cloud. Right? So that's kind of you know, classical, simple, classical argument. Uh, okay, so, but you know, that's actually always happens. So whether you're excited to the atoms to Lindbergh states or any other states, if you have a, an atoms, of course, you know, the probability of interaction will be enhanced. But this situation is quite special. The reason is that even though this probability of interaction is enhanced, uh, this macro atom is extremely nonlinear. So it can absorb one photon, but not two. There are no other states accessible here due to the blockade. So basically, this blockaded macro atom can be thought <coughs> as a kind of extremely nonlinear oscillator, the kind of most <coughs> linear oscillator you can imagine because it's two-level system, with this gig gigantic with enhanced absorption cross-section. So, and that's really the key feature which uh, this direction of the field is based upon. Right? So that's basically uh, uh, the basic idea. So, but going into this kind of formula, what we we'll do here is that instead of lambda squared, we will actually have uh, the cross section enhanced by the number of blockaded atoms, right? And that allows us to make this effective C to be very, very large and basically enter the domain of uh, of uh, kind of you know strong light matter and uh, photon photon interactions without requiring any cavity in principle. Right? So that's the idea. Uh, any questions? Let me pause here. So what I will do now, I'd like to sort of go and step by step and talk about kind of various elements, you know, of specific techniques which we use to really kind of make use of this effect in the experiment. But this, if you want, is really the kind of the most fundamental thing, you know, in the kind of work that I'm talking about. Any questions? <coughs> is everything clear or is everyone lost? So let me ask them a question to you. So, okay, so can you try to, uh, so if you wanted to kind of enhance it even further, what could you do? So it's clear that what you need to do is to basically uh, uh, have this number of <coughs> action, right? So how can you make how make how can you make this number large? How can you make the uh, you know, what's in practice 
you know, what would you do if you want to kind of plan experiment? What would you do to increase it? Yes. Uh, I, I think that this is related to the density and the blockade radius. Exactly. So we can just, if uh, for a fixed blockade radius, we can just have to increase, increase the density. density. Yes, that's correct. So that's the most straightforward thing to do. So then, okay, so that's one thing. So how could you increase the blockade radius? Uh, is the, the higher. Exactly, go to higher impact state, right? So these are the two knobs which we'll have to, uh, to, to, to plan. So now let me ask, okay, so this was a kind of nice simple warm-up question. Let me ask you a little bit more detail. So how much can I in practice increase the density? So can I, by increasing the density, by making more and higher and higher, could I increase this for a given n? Can I increase this indefinitely or not? That's, I would say, that's a question which even maybe some experts in the field might not know. Actually, it's a matter of fact, I, I think I know kind of qualitatively the answer, but, but that has not been worked out. <coughs> so what is, what, what, what is, how much can I, I'm, so um, this argument, so basically it corresponds to the limits, in, you know, of this argument. So to what, you know, can I always use this argument? You know, can I keep them increasing density indefinitely? So probably not, right? Because eventually the atoms, you know, the ground state atoms will start in, in interacting and, you know, eventually, you know, the gas will become, you know, solid, right? So it's, um, but, you know, but something will probably happen before that, which will... The well, it's condensate it is not bad, right? So why, <laughs> why, why not? So we're not using condensate in our experiments, but it certainly would not, you know, increasing the density a little bit is not bad. Any other ideas? And this actually is related, in fact, not only uh, sort of you should be able to kind of guess or, you know, think about the answer based on my talks, but actually you were sort of told the answer yesterday by Charles. So what's, uh, what's, what's going to happen if you, if you start putting more and more atoms uh, in a given volume? Right? You're going to be Exactly. So what happens then? Then atoms uh, start kind of not only the atoms in the Rydberg state start interacting, but also, for example, the atoms uh, which are kind of excited to low uh, to low energy state will start interacting, right? And what this will do? It will start broadening the line of this atom, right? So basically, what we sort of assume here is that somehow our kind of line width, effective line width, the effective cross-section for a single atom is fixed. Right? But if you start, for example, if you put much more than one atom in a reduced cubic wavelength, then what will happen is that even the low energy excited state, you know, will start to get broader. And effectively, this will result in a reduction of cross-section, right? So these limits have not been fully worked out. Okay, now, of course, I sort of Realize maybe I did not quite tell the full story here of what's going on, but you know that's the kinds of questions which are really a little bit now in the frontier of this field, right? So it gives you a little bit of a feeling. Yeah. Based of course, the other thing that was mentioned in my talk, maybe that you have ground state atoms inside the Rydberg orbit, which also broadens the line. Exactly. So this is another limit. That's another important thing, right? So that will limit how how far, if, if n, you can go. Exactly, exactly, exactly. That's another important consideration. Exactly. So these are, you know, that's really, so that really kind of brings you a little bit to the frontier of the field, you know, already. Okay, <coughs> other questions? All right. So let's now kind of go a little bit into details and talk about what tools do we use specifically kind of in the lab to really you know, take advantage of this kind of enhanced uh, cross-section. So, one elegant approach involves the use of electromagnetically induced transparency. Electromagnetically induced transparency 
This is a technique which allows one to make the uh, resonant optical medium, uh, which is normally will be completely apart, transparent. The way how this works is that you know normally you just excite this uh, medium with some kind of probe or signal field, and uh, you know you promote the atoms from the ground state to the excited state, from which they can decay and basically dissipate the energy in all modes. Uh, but what you do then you kind of make use of additional metastable field uh, state, and uh, what you do is basically in addition to this. Uh, let's say, not nominally weak probe field, you send in a strong control field. And what the strong control field does, it basically takes the atoms which were excited uh, by the signal light to this uh, kind of optically excited state and basically uh, promotes and dumps them very rapidly into this metastable state. And so what uh, then happens is that basically uh, uh, you create this kind of coherence, the coherent superposition between this metastable uh, state and this, and this superposition basically uh, causes a transparency, right? So, and um, uh, for instance, um, uh, if you uh, uh, then scan the detuning of the probe field, then what you will observe in this case uh, usually is a transmission spectrum like this, so away from resonance you have pretty good transparency, then you approach the resonance the medium uh, becomes optically dense, but then you hit this point close to this so-called two-photon resonance condition where the difference of these two frequencies matches precisely this transition energy between the metastable states where the medium becomes transparent. And this uh, kind of peak here is called transparency window. This transparency window can be controlled by, for example, changing the power of the control field if you make the control field stronger, you make this uh, uh, transparency window a little bit broader. Uh, and uh, then in addition, of course, you know, um, uh, uh, this is kind of absorption and there is also index of refraction. And actually index of refraction uh, exhibits this kind of very steep variation across the transparency window. And this steep variation is precisely what causes, for example, reduction in, in, in group velocity, right? And that's what, uh, for example, it's the kind of stuff that you know we discussed last, you know, uh, last night, uh, last evening in the, in the presentation uh, of Matthias's group. So, uh, just for future references, what I like to do is maybe kind of um, uh, just write down uh, some you know few important things about AIT. And so at this point, we just consider propagation of the kind of weak um, classical field. And uh, normally, this is quantified by susceptibility. The medium response is quantified by susceptibility. So basically, what you can do is for this three level system, uh, you can uh, derive uh, the susceptibility. So this is uh, this scales for n lambda q. Uh, so let me just Talking was here. So let's consider this situation where you know, the atom starts its life in one of these uh, lower states, and then uh, I have this kind of weak probe field and a strong driving field. And for example, this could be uh, the so called two photon detuning. So this is basically an uh, energy difference between. Uh, essentially a pair of these fields and this metastable state. So it's a detuning from a two-photon transition. And this, for example, a detuning <coughs> excited state. So this is a decay of the excited state. So basically, this um, susceptibility can be written uh, sky is proportional to n lambda cubed. Uh, Delta times gamma divided by omega squared plus uh, minus I delta <coughs> so, uh, so this, you know, for example, you can uh, look up the derivation uh, of this equation in my lecture notes. <coughs> So um, and you know so this susceptibility 
kind of contains a lot of this, you know, kind of physics which I talked about, for example, for delta equals zero, in this case, the uh, both, you know, the chi is equal to zero, right? So both refractive index is equal to unity and there is no absorption. Uh, then, uh, for instance, um, if you look to the, at the leading order for small data, so basically you can neglect this thing, and what you see is that this is just, you know, chi varies linearly with the, uh, uh, with the, uh, uh, with the detuning, right, that corresponds to this kind of group velocity uh, term, right? And, uh, uh, moreover, what you can do then sort of keep expanding so that, for example, the second order term will be proportional to delta squared, right? And this term will actually correspond to increasing absorption. So this will mean that you know, absorption is only, transparency is only perfect right here in the center, but when you go away from this, you know, you start you know, to have an increasing absorption. So actually, you know, maybe let me kind of write down this, you know, for delta small, and maybe this big delta equals to zero, so for this situation where you know, both of these two fields are close to single quantum resonance, what you can do, you can extend uh, this, this thing here um, into something like delta delta omega squared plus i delta squared. Kind of an expansion plus, of course, there will be some other terms. Right? So this term corresponds to the reduced group velocity. This term will give right, will basically respond to effective bandwidth of transparency. Right? So that's you know this this term is responsible to the fact that eventually transparency goes down. Right? Does it make sense? Any questions? Now, where is like Remember all of these arguments which I made early on about this kind of uh, uh, lambda squared over g? Can you see this, you know, this kind of, you know, resonance cross section and so on? Can you see this here from the from the susceptibility? So how is this stuff connected with this stuff? So can you from susceptibility, can you derive this expression for the probability of interaction? Mm. Any ideas how to do it? Right, so how do we make use of susceptibility? Right? Make use of, so if you want, for example, to see a phase change and you want to see kind of to understand the, uh, the kind of probability of absorption, right? So for example, the phase change goes as chi uh, times k times f, right? But L is the length of the medium. Right? And absorption, basically, you know, the, the probability of absorption, the absorption coefficient, if you want, right? So this, this goes like real, in this sense, imaginary into it times k. So k is a, uh, is a two pi over lambda, right? What you see here, for example, so if you if you take, um, I mean, so if you don't have any, uh, so if this is little delta and it is very large, right? So then essentially chi is proportional to the n lambda cubed over. So this is just an absorb the kind of the chi that has not normally, right? So then what will happen is that. For example, here you will have n over v lambda cubed 2 pi over uh, lambda times L, right? So this basically is nothing but um, n number of atoms lambda squared 
over d squared. Right? So it just shows the probability of interaction. Does it make sense? Okay, so this uh, is these kind of things are important to understand. Right? Because they give you sort of it really kind of gives you an intuitive connection between different ways of looking at the different problems, right? So very seldom when we actually do the calculation, we sort of start writing down this cross section of atom and so on. You know, most often when you know we do calculation, we use this kind of stuff. But it's important to know the connection between these two things. Any questions? Does it make sense? Yeah. Did you say? Kappa was the length of the medium? Or L, L, L is the length. Oh, L. So kappa is just the wave vector. K, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah K, and K is 2 to 5 over L, L is like a solution. So, any other questions? This is the measurement of each K. Okay, so. Um, all right, so we already started, you know, actually on that. So I'm a little bit kind of um, ahead of, my, of myself. So we already started talking about the physics of dark elements. But so let's now, I mean, okay, or do these equations, they sort of don't really tell a story. So where does transparency come from? <coughs> so how can we understand it? <coughs> so uh, in order to answer these questions, we should go back to this, you know, four rules which we have learned already. So which of the rules, which of the principles should we use to understand the physics of dark states? Exactly. So we need to, so, so the first rule is that, you know, we should think about the rest of it. This kind of, you know, system with three levels, you know, two fields is already kind of a little bit too complicated, you know, to just look at it and, you know, write, I mean, of course, can write down these equations which describe it, but, you know, it kind of gets, complicated, you know, rather quickly, so, but, you know, what we can think about, we can really think about the situation, you know, using, about using the rest atom picture to understand it. And uh, in this case, in particular, so let's consider, um, uh, once again, this three-level system with two classical fields driving it, and uh, the Hamiltonian for the system actually looks quite simple, right, so, uh, it's a generalization of the two atom Hamiltonian. So, uh, in particular, uh, basically what I have here is like a one classical field coupling this transition, another classical field coupling this transition, and, uh, uh, and that's it. So, uh, for this Hamiltonian, uh, uh, what one could do is one could just try to find now the new eigenstates. Uh, so we started with three states, there will be three new eigenstates. But actually there is one eigenstate which is particularly important. In particular, so uh, if you uh, uh, consider the state uh, of the kind shown here, uh, and basically uh, just ask what will uh, Hamiltonian do while acting on this state, what you will immediately realize is that this state is an eigenstate of this Hamiltonian with zero eigenvalue. So what's the physics of that? Well, the physics is that in this state, uh, the amplitudes uh, uh, for the atom to be in these two metastable states are such that, you know, basically these two uh, classical fields, uh, when they excite the atom in this uh, superposition, kind of interfere destructively. So basically, you know, uh, when you start from here and when you start from here and you end up in this state, there is a destructive interference such that essentially when this Hamiltonian takes on the state, there is zero, right? So atom starting in this superposition, as a result, will not interact with this pair of fields. Or in other words, the atom in this superposition state will be dark. That's the essence of the dark state. So, uh, so basically the physics of what happens here is that there are two absorption paths and when the atom is prepared in a properly kind of phase state, then uh, this um, uh, 
interference basically prevents atomic transition and eliminates atomic absorption. Right, but of course, this is only one of the three states. So there are two more states. You know, if the atom is placed in these two states, it will still undergo some dynamics. So the best way to actually think about uh, this kind of um, lambda type transitions is basically to consider the uh, free, to, to consider this kind of partially dressed states. So the dark state has a zero eigenvalue, so this will be one of the states. But then what one could also introduce, one could introduce a so-called bright state. So the bright state essentially is a combination of the two metastable states, which essentially couples to the excited state. Right? So there is one combination of the metastable states which does not couple to the excited state, and there is another combination, which basically is, uh, write this down, which is proportional to alpha, down on this slide, plus one meter up, <coughs> which will couple to this excited state by this commuter. <coughs> will happen, so the, the physical picture which we really can draw there is that I have now uh, three new, uh, new states. One is a dark state, which is decoupled. One is a bright state, which still involves superposition of the two metastable state, which is coupled to the excited state, and then there is an excited state. And actually, this coupling, one can show that this coupling will be given by the square root of the sum of the two brackets. Uh, Okay, any questions? All right, so what we can do now, we can use this observation of the fact that we have this dark state and this physical picture to really try to kind of analyze what will be the physics of this type of EIT system. So in particular, you might ask a question. Aha, so clearly if you prepare your system in this dark state, then it will not absorb. But in the, in the previous slide, I actually do, didn't do any kind of special preparation. I just send in a light beam and somehow transparency, transparency miraculously occurred. Why?